Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Swancat 11 and Jakarta EU session. Uh, I've only got half an hour, so I'm going to keep this fairly short. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Thomas. I've been a Tomcat committer since 2003. I do a few other things around the ASF as well. Uh, my day job, currently at Broadcom, has a very simple job description, which is go and do whatever I think is best for Tomcat, which gives me quite a bit of freedom, which I quite enjoy. Um, I've also been involved over at Eclipse because when Java EE became Jakarta EE, um, moved to Eclipse, and then I got involved there as well. So, as I said, again, it's going to be quite short. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Jakarta EE 11, then where we are in terms of implementing that in Tomcat, and I'll also then find, wrap up with some other notable changes that are in Tomcat 11 that aren't directly related to um, Jakarta EE. So let's dive into Jakarta EE. Most people think the four specifications that Tomcat implements, so server, pages, WebSocket, and expression language, we actually implement six we implement the annotations and the authentication specifications as well. Uh, authentication used to be called JASPIC, the Java Authentication Service Provider Interface for Containers. So the rename is very much appreciated because I don't have to remember that acronym anymore. So in, there are some general changes that apply across um, Jakarta EE 11. The first one is the minimum version is now Java 17. Um, well, yes-ish, sort of, for all intents and purposes. It was 21 briefly, and then that got changed. That's a presentation and a story all on itself. Um, come and find me later if you want all the gory details on that one. But the, the practical upshot is the minimum version is Java 17. Uh, references to the security manager are being removed, or have been removed. Uh, and security manager dates back right back to the early days of Java, back when so you had one big server supporting lots of tenants and you needed the separation between them. You know, things have moved on, we use VMs and containers now, that's what provides the separation. The JVM doesn't need to. Uh, the security manager was complicated, wasn't heavily used, was causing various problems for new features. So it's generally being phased out from Java. So it's being phased out from Jakarta EE as well. And I am very happy to say that was one of my favorite commits where I just got to go through and go delete, 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 delete. It was, I love fixes and changes like that, very easy to implement. Um, the other thing that um, Jakarta EE 11 doing is stuff that's been deprecated for the last 15 years is actually finally being removed. Um, so you'll see that in a lot of the specifications. There's old crust in the server APIs that's gone, uh, similarly in, in GSVs, and particularly some of the really old server stuff. Uh, the HTTP util class, or whatever it was, that was basically a bunch of no-op methods, that, all that's gone, finally. Um, and again, you'll see that throughout all of the, the specifications. So if I look at the uh, individual specifications, server is really where there's been most changes. Um, so, in summary, lots of clarifications. So, things like headers. Uh, the spec was quite clear how it should behave if you call get header and the header had multiple values. But it wasn't clear what if I call get int header or get date header and there are multiple values? What if I start setting headers with empty strings or null values? What impact should that have? All of that has now been explicitly defined, so you should get more consistent behaviour. Um, HTTPS was a fun one. The spec said it was optional and then said HTTP2 was required and HTTP2 requires HTTPS. So is HTTPS optional or is it required? Well, it is required. That's, uh, so the spec now says that. Um, async writes. Uh, we were very, the spec specification was very clear that before you performed an asynchronous write operation, you must call is ready and is ready must return true. What it didn't really come, what is an async write operation and what isn't? Is a flush a write operation or not? Is closing the socket a write operation or not? That ambiguity has been, been tidied up. Um, and path canonicalization, you would get slightly different behaviors across different servers if you started using um, percent encoding for characters that don't need it, or start putting in slash dot dot slash dot dot slash sequences into your URLs. That behavior is now clearly defined in the spec and you will get consistent behavior across the containers when you should. 
Um, we've added some new standard request attributes. So when you do forwards and includes, you can now get the original request method and get the original query string. You've got much better control over doing redirects. You can say what status code you want to use. You can add a request body or have control over the request body that goes with the redirect. Normally it just says where it's redirecting to, but if you want it to say something else, you can. Um, you can control whether you use an absolute or a relevant URL. You've all of that control you've now got available through the standard APIs. Get Prattle, oh, this was a fun one. So when we introduced the file upload API to Servlet, you could also obtain server param uh, request parameters via the upload API. And if there was some sort of I.O. issue whilst you were reading those, you'd get an exception if you went through the file upload API. If you went through the standard get parameter API, you didn't get an exception. What was more fun, if you went parameter API first, then file upload API, you wouldn't get an exception. If you went to the file upload API first, you would. Um, that's all been cleaned up. You will now consistently always get an exception, however you do it. And that does mean that um, get parameter methods that you previously didn't throw exceptions now will. But I think that, that's a good thing because it's telling you the stuff's broken that you need to know about. Um, less relevant to servlet, but very useful for WebSocket, and I'll talk about more there. There is now a mechanism where you can safely access the HTTP session outside of the normal request response cycle. A often overlooked part of the server spec is that it says any object you obtain from the request or the response is only valid whilst the request and the response is valid. Now, as it happens, the session is often valid outside of, of that range, and it is often used outside of that range. But there are circumstances, normally involving clustering and replication, where that falls down, and there is no safe way to access the session. Uh, we've now provided a mechanism that lets you do that outside of the question say it's particularly for WebSocket, and I'll talk more about it when we get to WebSocket. Uh, added by buffer support for the input output streams, and HTTP server push is now deprecated. This was a nice idea that didn't really work. So the idea was that if you had a request A, you, you request resource A, resource A knows it needs B, C, and D, their style sheets, images, whatever. So the server says, oh, right, you want A, you're going to need B, C, and D in a minute. So I'll start sending you B, C, and D, and HTTP had server push that lets the server start sending this, server send this down. The idea being it would be more efficient because you could start sending them sooner. The problem was that the client would receive this push saying, I've already got that reset. I've already got, no, I don't want it. I've got it. Stop sending the stuff I've got. It, it wasn't actually that efficient because the server had no idea what the client was caching. So then the server had to start trying to get one of Have I sent that before to this client? Should it already be in the cache? Oh, it, it was messy. It just didn't really work. So what's replaced it is uh, one in three early hints. So now what happens is that you send the request for resource A, the server will send you back a 103 response, which is an informational response, it's not the final answer, but that informational response will have a set of headers in it and say, these are the resources this resource is going, probably going to request. And the client can then look at those headers and say, got it, got it, got it, need it, go and request it. So the client is now in control and the client can actually request the things it needs and that's much more efficient than work, working uh, much more nicely. There is no API for uh, early hints in the server spec yet. Um, Jetty's got an implementation of it that we're probably just going to take and put into the spec, and we will put it into Tomcat as well. I'm expecting that to be some turning up fairly early in 11, but it's not there yet. So that's the server spec. Pages, um, that's nice and simple. There's no real change, it's just when things have changed in servlet or expression language that have an impact on pages, then pages has had to update a few things. But it's really just acknowledging that you know, the list of standard expression language resolvers has changed. That's listed in the pages spec, so that had to be updated. It's, it's that kind of stuff. No, nothing fundamental at all. Um, expression language, the one big change here is that there is no longer a mandatory dependency on the Java Beans package. Um, some people won't give a monkeys about that. Other people say, actually, that's really useful because I'm trying to write uh, applications using the Java platform module system. And if I do that, I pull in expression language. Expression language requires Java beans, and that pulls in the entire of the Java desktop module, which is huge, and I don't want it. So now, 
Uh, expression language won't do that unless you explicitly say, I need to use Java Beans. If it's there, it will use it. If not, it will use its own internal implementation instead. A uh, couple of other things, we've added length support for arrays, we've added support for records, um, and we've also added optional support for optionals. So if you've got a Java bean that's got, you know, bean's got a property that's another bean that's got another, you'd, you'd end up with an expression that I have bean.a.field.b.fieldc.fieldd. You, you, you just resolve that through expression language. If any of those were optionals, that wouldn't work because it would just return the optional. It wouldn't return what the optional's wrapping. If you add the optional EL resolver, it will now unwrap the optional and the chain will continue. If the optional is empty, you'll just get an empty optional at the end of it. So that all works nicely with optionals now. Uh, WebSocket, there's one very small change to the API, which we've added the ability to read the session from the send results. Uh, the big difference is this ability to interact with the HTTP session. Because what this was something that lots of um, WebSocket applications want and need to do. When you when you initially start the WebSocket connection, that started from an HTTP request, you've got access to it, you can access the session. And what they wanted to be able to do is, well, I want to carry on interacting with the session, I want to keep that session alive. Um, and there was no way of doing that. You, applications happen to do things like issue fake HTTP requests in order to keep the HTTP session alive or do other strange things. Now, uh, you get a session object during the handshake, you can then get a accessor from that, which you can retain a reference to, and then essentially you call that accessor with uh, a session consumer, and what happens is effectively, every time you do that, it will be treated as if you started an HTTP request, so the, se the session's last access time will be updated. It will then, your consumer will receive the session, you can do whatever you want to the session, add attributes, read attributes, whatever, and then when that method exits, it'll tr be treated as the end of the HTTP request and the, the access times, etc., will be updated. But it's all done properly, um, and that way you have a nice mechanism for interacting with the HTTP session. Um, and it's a really a huge benefit for WebSocket, but actually all of the work was done on the server side. Um, it should be really beneficial for WebSocket. Uh, the others, uh, annotation, as far as I can tell, the only thing they did was they deleted the managed bean annotation because it was deprecated. And authentication, as far as I can tell, the only change was they removed all the security manager stuff, so a couple of public constants disappeared, but otherwise, functionally, they are unchanged. So that brings us on to Tomcat's implementation. Now, given I've got, this is a fairly short presentation, I thought about just putting the word, it's done, on the screen. Um, but there's a little bit more to it than that, but fundamentally, it is. Uh, we're passing the TC, all the TCKs for expression language by topic server and pages. Um, those TCKs have all been refactored as part of Ducati 11. They now are Quillian-based JUnit tests. They're a lot easier for us to interact with. Uh, a lot easier for us to run and a lot quicker. Uh, we have a GitHub project that integrates Tomcat with those TCKs. Um, it, you, you can run it yourself if you want to. We're going to be setting it up running on CI fairly shortly as well. Um, the expression language and WebSocket have all been, those releases have been completed. Uh, server and pages are in the final ballot, so in theory they're not going to change. Um, theoretically they might, but it seems pretty unlikely. So we're pretty much at the position where, give it another week or so, and I'm expecting those ballots to complete, then those specs will be final. And then as far as Tomcat's concerned, we can move out of alpha releases, because we're only in alpha releases because the specs aren't final. Once the specs are final, we can go to at least beta releases, and given that Tomcat 11 is very similar to Tomcat 10.1, I don't see there being that long between us having the beta releases and actually getting the Tomcat 11 stable releases. Personally, I'm expecting that later in the summer. Um, I'm looking around at my fellow PMC members and none of them are staring at me with daggers, so we, that might happen. We shall see. It's a community decision when it becomes stable, but I think we're pretty close. So, other new features. Uh, these aren't necessarily Tomcat 11 specific. Uh, because we tend to backport stuff to the earlier versions, this is more a list of new features that's been added to Tomcat since we started work on Tomcat 11. Would probably be a slightly more accurate description. 
Generally, they're available by, by default unless Java 17 is required. Uh, sorry, Java above 17 is required, for which there is only one. Um, Tomcat 11 was fought from Tomcat 10.1.1, so anything that's in 10.1.1 and earlier will be in Tomcat 11. Uh, obviously, for full details, go and look at the change log. I just cherry pick the stuff that I think is significant, interesting, or uh, gives me something to talk about. Now, so let's talk about adding features, and then actually the first thing I'm going to talk about is the stuff we've removed. Um, so, like Jakarta EE, we've got rid of all the security manager support. We've also removed some connector settings. This is generally in line with what we've been doing over time in terms of um, stricter adherence to the specifications, removing things that tend to cause security problems. So, HTTP headers that have, Ill have illegal characters in them, you used to be able to let them through if you configured Tomcat to allow it. No, we just don't. Fundamentally, because you can pretty much, the only re reason that for allowing them through, typically because somebody wants to perform some form of request injection attack, and so we just block them. Um, host header mismatch, again, clients shouldn't be sending mismatching host headers. The host header should align with any host that's in the request line. If they don't, we're going to reject that again. That's to trying to do some interesting things with bypassing proxies or getting the proxy to misbehave, so we just block it. Um, technically, we re we've removed 32-bit Windows support. All that really means is the 32-bit Windows binary for Commons daemon isn't present. If you really need it, you can put it back and it will work and we will still support you. We're just not shipping it. That stemmed from we were we originally went to Java 21 as the minimum. Java 21 wasn't available with Windows 32 bit, so we took the opportunity to drop it. When we went back down to Java 17, we didn't reintroduce the Windows 32 bit because we couldn't really see the point. Um, but yeah, if you really need it, you can use it and we'll, we'll still help. Um, and it's an HTTP server to push. Whilst it's technically optional, as far as the server specs are concerned, we've just removed it completely. Uh, there, there, there is no way to enable it in Tomcat 11. Um, on the RFC front, we've generally made sure that we're aligned with the latest version of various RFCs. The basic authentication, all that really means is we're careful about trimming white space off the ends of usernames and passwords and header values and making sure that behaves properly. So well-behaved clients shouldn't really notice any difference. Digest authentication, um, you've now got SHA-256 support as well as MD5, um, so it's just a little bit more secure. Um, and HTTP, HTTP priority, which really affects HTTP2. Uh, the very complicated, horrible to implement tree-based priority mechanism that was originally in HTTP2 has been removed, and we've switched to the much simpler um, priority mechanism in RFC uh, 9218, and that's in 11 and all the way back to 9 as well. On the logging side, a couple of places we've added dedicated loggers for specific things. And I'm sure it's not TLS certificates aren't the only one, but it's the only one I could find on the lock through the change log. I'm pretty sure I've got them in somewhere else as well, but I can't remember where. Um, but where you want a lot of detailed information about something such as what certificates configured, then there is now a dedicated logger that lets you get absolutely everything. So it's there if you need it, you can just turn on debug logging for that logger, but it's not there by default. Uh, access logs are available with JSON outputs, um, and Chris has added additional granularity options for the access logs. So whether you want it in seconds, milliseconds, or microseconds, you can have your access logs in um, in those files. And for an interesting discussion on Fempo seconds, have a look at the dev list. <laughs> um, on the security side, generally this is this is hardening stuff. So, um, what during formal authentication, there is now a shorter session timeout by default. That just makes it harder to do a uh, formal authentication to do some form of denial of service attack. Rate limiting filter, that's available. Again, it reduces the opportunities for um, denial of service. The default max parameter count is now um, coded to a thousand rather than just configured to a thousand in the uh, server XML. Again, that's all hardening to reduce denial of service opportunities. Uh, session cookies, you can set the partitioned attributes if you want. There's actually gen general support for um, cookie attributes that don't have values, and that general support is available both in the server spec and in Tomcat. The idea being that 
the last few attributes have been added that have been interesting have all been security related and they've all required API changes to add support for them. And that just delays how quickly they're available. So now we've got generic support. So when the next one's invented, you can just start using it straight away without having to wait for the APIs to catch up. Um, for those of you that use the cross-site request forgery filter, if you've got resources that are safe, that don't need to be protected, that you want to exclude, it's now easy to do that. Um, and if your users have custom attributes that you want to make available in the principles that are exposed in the application, you can now do that through the realms as well. A few bits and pieces, I've talked about the general support for cookie attributes. The translations continue to expand by a, a PO editor. Um, always looking for more, more uh, contributions there. You can redirect error reports to an external server if you want. Um, the utility executor that we use to deploy web applications and do other sort of administrative stuff inside Tomcat, that's available for the web applications to use for those sorts of maintenance tasks as well if they wish. Um, on the performance side, uh, John Frederick's already talked a little bit about foreign function memory. If you have uh, Java 22 and you run Tomcat on that, you can now use OpenSSL directly via, via FFM without having to have Tomcat native installed. The main advantage is it doesn't crash. Um, Tomcat, nat uh, Tomcat native is a lot, just providing the, the um, just providing the, the encryption is a lot better than the APR connector is. The APR connector still has a few kinks in it that we haven't quite got to the bottom of. But in terms of stability, FFM is a is another step forward. Performance-wise, it's about the same, probably a little bit slower on average at the moment, but that's improving. Um, but the, the real benefit is the stability. You don't need to install another library. You can just use the OpenSSL that's available on um, your system. Uh, we've added support for virtual threads. Uh, a, virtual threads are also a whole other talk, but I'll of the edited highlights are, despite what some people might say, virtual threads are not a magic make your web application run faster option. They do not make it any faster. Well, strictly, there's a few microseconds you'll get if you switch to virtual threads, but the price you'll pay is that your latency distribution will be a lot wider. So generally, it's performance-wise, there's very little in it. It's all down in the, in the fine detail. Where virtual threads will give you a huge benefit is if your web application is doing a lot of blocking I.O., talking to databases, talking to other services, then <coughs> switching to virtual threads will give you a massive scalability gain. You'll be able to support far more users on, on, the, on the same Tomcat instance. So that's where the real benefits are with virtual threads. It's the scalability when your application is doing a lot of blocking I.O. If that's not the case, virtual threads aren't really going to give you very much, despite what some of the hype might have suggested. Um, and with that, how am I doing for time? Not too bad. Um, happy to take any questions.